I had, I had women saying, well, what do I do to get a guy Rolo? Like help, help me. How do I get it? How do I get the, the, the high value guy? I'm 33, 36 years old. And I'm, I'm telling them, I'm saying, well, the first thing you need to do is, is what we've been telling men since the seventies is you need to get in touch with your feminine side. <laughs> you need to, uh, you need to be become, you know, understand your emotionality and, and understand that, you know, there's a, there men and women are different. We're better together than we are apart. We're better, you know, we're innate, natural compliments no to one another. No and they're like, well, how do I do that? How do I do that? And I go, well, you've got to get in touch with your femininity. And when I say something like that to a woman who has, for the most of her life, built herself up around this sort of alpha female paradox, uh, it sounds like I'm saying, dumb yourself down. And they, they, yeah. they can't interpret it any other way. That's not what I'm saying. But to to say, well, you need to be more feminine. You need to be more uh, nurturing. You need to be more, uh, you know, sexy. I guess too. I mean, to take care of yourself physically as well. But you have to be. You have to, in some way, care about how men think about you, yeah. in an era when you've been raised since you were five years old with Disney Pixar movies to tell you that you should never, in any way, be dependent on a man or or be concerned with anyone's pleasure except for your own. So that's a really, it's really tough for women who for their whole life have heard this narrative. And then now they're 36 and they don't know what to do. And I'm saying, um, you know, get in touch with your feminine side. And they're like, how dare you? <laughs> and now here's your host, Jason Hartman with the complete solution for real estate investors. Greetings from beautiful Ritz Carlton, Lake Oconee, Georgia. I am here today just finishing up a fantastic mastermind retreat. This is an all men's retreat, and we had some really good conversations, met a bunch of new people, a bunch of listeners to the podcast, uh, <laughs> glad to hear that always, and a lot of uh, real estate investors here, and uh, it's just been a really, really great time. Yesterday, we got up early for the sunrise and enjoyed some water sports. Uh, wakeboarding, wake surfing, uh, jet skiing yesterday afternoon, and uh, just a whole bunch of fun times. And I thought I'd just give you a beautiful sunrise here. It is 7 a.m. on the dot here at the Ritz-Carlton Lake Oconee, Georgia. And I just thought I'd share this with you. If you are watching on video, you can see behind me <laughs> this absolutely gorgeous sunrise over the lake. Uh, so really, really nice. Anyway, we have got a fantastic 10th episode show for you today. I do want to give a bit of a trigger warning because our guest today is Rolo Tomasi. If you don't know that name, he is a very well-known author. He's written several books, sold almost 3 million books. And it's interesting that he is such an expert in the field that you're about to hear about because he has been married for, I think, 23 years and has, I believe his daughter is 21 years old or something like that. I uh, was fortunate to hang out with he and his wife, Missy, about a month ago in Reno, Nevada and Tahoe, Nevada. And we did all kinds of things there. That was great. But Rolo is the author of the Rational Male series and then some other books as well. But the Rational Male series has been very famous series of books. They take a deep dive into social and cultural dynamics. And I think you'll really enjoy this very long 10th episode show interview. And just as you're listening to this, it is a 10th episode show. So of course, it's off topic. It's, it's a non-financial topic. But I want you to think about the financial implications of this topic, because they are so wide ranging. When we think of uh, real estate investing and we think of the demand for housing and we think of how people are not coupling up the way they used to. And I've talked many times, as you know, by the way, as the sun's rising, the light is changing quite a bit here. So uh, bear with me on that. Uh, we have uh, very basic production quality here if you're watching on video. I've got my laptop in front of me, this beautiful sunrise in the background, and basically have the lighting of my iPhone. 
<laughs> yes, that, that's our studio, if you will. And pardon the sound quality, but hopefully you can hear the beautiful chirping of the birds and so forth. But think of the wide ranging implications of all of the stuff we're about to talk about as you're listening to Rolo and I get into this deep conversation about the way social dynamics have changed over the years. And I got to give you a trigger warning again, because some people really uh, take issue with this. Now, I think that's wrong. I, I don't think they should take issue at all. I think they should listen with an open mind as to how these dynamics play out because they really are disastrous in so, so many ways. So we'll get to that in a moment. It's a long discussion, okay? Uh, this is probably the longest 10th episode show we've ever done, episode 1900 here today. But just back to the group a bit, you know, I used to be involved in men's groups through my church when I lived in Newport Beach, California. And they were fantastic because guys would get together, we'd go on retreats, you know, there'd be a couple hundred guys there. You know, they'd talk about their relationships, their financial life, their deals, their investments, and so forth. And we did that yesterday at our round table after we listened to a couple of speakers, you know, and it, it's just so important to do that because you get a very different flavor when the sexes are separated, right? You know, people just interact much differently. It's just really fulfilling. And, and you know, it's, it's been a while since I've done that. When I was involved in, in Mariner's Church, when I lived in Southern California, you know, I was involved in the men's groups and they were great. They were really great. We'd have meetings at the church on the campus, but then we'd go on retreats in the mountains and so forth. And, and that's what this has been like, because this is an all men's group, 100% guys here, and just uh, really fulfilling to have these conversations and to hear about their deals and their financial stresses and relationships and so forth. One of the tips I got just yesterday from one of the speakers, literally, it was a tax tip, and my my CPA did not know about this, and, and I, I sent him a message right away, and I said, hey, what about this? And he thought the, the law was different. And when I told him about it and I told him what the speaker said, he researched it and he said, yeah, you're right. You know, that's a loophole that they haven't closed yet. And literally, this will probably save me about $200,000 in tax this year. That's how valuable these events and education, right? And so I really encourage you to join us for our upcoming virtual event, Recession Proof Investing Summit. Real easy virtual event. It's just, what, two weeks away, and it's going to be fantastic. And then our following live event in beautiful Scottsdale, Arizona in late January. Save the date for that. Many of you have reached out to me and say, where can I register for the Scottsdale event? I want to go. We don't have a page up for that yet, but attend our virtual event. Go and register for that one at jasonhartman.com and you will be offered a nice discount for the Scottsdale event at that virtual event. So attend both. They'll be different. By the way, speaking of taxes, we just confirmed Rich Dad author Tom Wheelwright, who will be speaking again at our Scottsdale event. He spoke at our Newport Beach event a few years ago. You, if you attended that one, you'll remember. And he's going to talk about the latest and greatest strategies for saving on life's highest expense, taxes, right? We've got to become experts in how to save money on taxes. So go to jasonartman.com, get a ticket for our upcoming virtual event, and then soon we will have a page for you to get tickets for our live event in beautiful Scottsdale, Arizona, late January, but save the dates for that. That's the last weekend of January, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday in Scottsdale, Arizona. Okay, so let's get to our very in-depth interview with famous author Rolo Tomasi as we talk about the rational male. We talk about these social dynamics that have just changed so dramatically in our culture. And in my opinion, not for the better. They've changed for the worse dramatically. And that's why you see such a shifting pattern in housing demand, demand for consumer products, taxation, the impact on the economy. It is so wide ranging and so significant and already got up and worked out this morning. But now 
we're going to go do some yoga here. They've got yoga on the lawn, this group, and so all the guys are out there, and I got to do that. So here's the interview with Rolo, and be sure to go to jasonhartman.com and register for our upcoming virtual event. It is my pleasure to welcome someone to the show who you probably wouldn't expect on my show, but it is an important topic, and that is Rolo Tomasi. He is the author of the Rational Male series of books. There are five books in the series, and he really takes a deep intellectual dive into social dynamics, the dynamics between the sexes, and you know this is a hot topic nowadays so i wanted to have him on the show rollo it's great to have you welcome yeah good good to be on with you jason's fine yeah. finally on with you <laughs> yeah absolutely and and you were at our collective event in dallas we heard you speak there and and got to hang out with you and it was really fun talking to you there so so great to have you on rollo i just like to ask you give everybody you know the 60 second elevator pitch as to you know you and what the rational mail series is about sure sure um giving an elevator pitch for the red pill is like next to impossible because it's <laughs> so diverse there's so much i think what happens executive is a lot summary of, okay so here's the quick summary um what we know as the, the quote-unquote manosphere right now um evolved from the seduction communities of the early 2000s and uh, a lot of people such as myself sort of took the ball and ran with it at that point um and so it's no longer just about like how do i get a girlfriend how do i go you know how do i get laid in a club or something like that it's more about intersexual dynamics uh there's a lot of subfields to it right now so it's a collection not just of you know learning how to interact and have social skills with women now it is uh gone from the micro to the macro and by that i mean we we go into intersexual dynamics now we go into social dynamics that have to do with gender uh gender politics uh, even uh macroeconomics of you know how to how does uh inner intersexual dynamics relate to like investments, how we form families. Um, you think about the, um, and how that impacts the economy because exactly Rollo and I got to tell you it all is, is I, just, I, I have taken deep dives on my show into the conspiracy, frankly, to either keep people single or if they're married to split them up. Yep. Think about it. Yep. You double the size of the consumer economy if people are single, they need two coffee makers, they need two sofas, they need two beds, they need two of everything, two houses, obviously. And if you you have them together, they're sharing things. So, exactly. you know, if you're the corporatocracy and you want to double the size of your market, you want to promote movies that split people up. You exactly. want to promote a media Division. culture of discontent, mm -hmm. right? Because that's going to double your market share, quite literally. Exactly. Double, think about it, double. And you go beyond that and you look at the tax impact and the impact on the GDP. I mean, in the 50s, can you imagine? People must have been stressing out. We've got half of our workforce at home raising mm -hmm. kids. We could put them to work, right? You know, like we need these women in the workforce so they're growing the GDP and right. growing the consumer society. Yeah. It's, and they're, and they're obvious, you know, well, I mean, when you look at, so like, as far as, you know, finishing the elevator pitch here. Yeah. I, especially when it comes to like broader topics that are micro related to how men and women actually come together, form families really is what it, what it comes yeah, down yeah. to. And then how does that impact the, the, well, really the character and the, the economy and the society of a particular country and exactly what you're saying. I, I was just on with George Gammon. And it's funny you should mention this. I was on with George Gammon. We we're talking about how uh, I think it's like, is it, is it, correct me if I'm wrong, it's Malthusian economics? Malthusian, yeah, that's the scarcity like economics, it's Population control right? yeah. is essentially is what it is. And it's yep. no longer, you know, having a war is not a, a the best practice, I guess, anymore to sort of, you know, cut down on excess population. So there's right. got to be social narratives and social institutions that that have the same effect. And really just what you mentioned a minute ago is it's, it's in a sort of socioeconomic best interest if we can put more women to work and we can yeah. um and you know make them like women are the primary consumers in the united states right now they buy more stuff than you know when we talk about um 
we talk about like the, the gender wage gap, for example, it's not about who's earning the money. It's about who's spending the money, yeah. <laughs> who has, right. who has the money and who is in control of the purse strings. And right now it's, it's primarily women that are uh, the, the economic drivers, at least in Western nations right now. Right. And uh, that was one of the, uh, the topics I even talked about when I was at the collective is that if you go and you look at like the world bank, you look at the IMF, you look at uh, what is it? The uh, European central bank, yep. they're all controlled by women right now. And yep. what does that, what does a society look like when women control the purse purse strings and the economics of you know the world bank <laughs> so so clearly you're not just talking about consumer spending you're talking about big banking i mean the imf yes. the world bank central banks you mm -hmm. know europe for example i mean wasn't um, janet yellen's this treasury secretary right right but that's not a central bank but she was our central banker still, a few years if ago you go yeah. and you look at if you go and you look at countries like the the top i think that in 16 of the top like you know western nations right now all of those nations the purse strings and the treasury and everything else is controlled the economy is controlled okay. by women in so there. here's the here's the multi-trillion dollar question what does that mean what changes mm -hmm. why does it matter if it's jerome powell or janet yellen at that top level that elite level of a, mm -hmm. a central bank or a treasury secretary how does that matter to society what what are what is okay. a woman going to do that's different okay here's the, here's the red pill take on that uh -huh. and something else i also talked about uh, at the collective is um when we look at that, women tend to uh, organize societies in a communitarian fashion. Okay. Right. We can go all the way back to when human beings were living in hunter gatherer tribes. For men, the way men organize society is hierarchical. Okay. So okay. at the top, there's the general and the, and then the lieutenants and the, you know, and the, the corporal all the way down to the privates. Right. So, uh, and that's very similar to how we organize businesses. So there's the president or the owner, and then there's the CEO, the COO the CFO, all the, all the people on down on in the hierarchical ranks, yep. when women organize societies and when they are offered some sort of political power, so socioeconomic power, the way women approach that is through communitarianism. So mm -hmm. when we look at like hunter gatherer tribes, for example, you've got men who go out and they uh, distribute resources or rewards based on performance. I mean, ideally, anyway, meritocracy, so, exactly a meritocracy. So if uh, and they've done uh, t there's tons of research on this, by the way, where they will take a group of men and they'll take a group of women and they will give them a limited amount of resources, whatever that happens to be. So for men, it's like, OK, we're going to do this project. We're going to do these things. And at the end of the project, we're going to distribute the resources. And Jim did a better jo uh, job than Joe did. And so he gets 10 bucks and right. Joe, you did pretty good. So you get five bucks and, and Steve and Mike and all the rest of you guys, you get three bucks and on down the line, as far as like what the performance was rated versus, you know, what, what it is that they contributed to that project for women. It's much different. They're, they're much more um, communitarian is the best way I can put it, but um, it's egalitarianism. So it's like one yep. for you and one for you and one for you and one, oh, and Sue, you're pregnant. So two for you and Joan, you know, one for you and one for you. And it's, okay. it's much so more. So here, here's the question. Egalitarian think, and socialist. Yeah, I think we all agree with that assessment. But is that bad? Uh, it depends on this. Is, it, it's bad in the sense that when women come into a hierarchical organization, such as the American workforce right now, that has been classically based on hierarchy. And women come in and they say, well, I got to be here for 40 hours a week because I want to be more more like a man. I want to be in the workforce. I want to be sort of the you know, the alpha female um, archetype. Um, but uh, we need to have uh, pregnancy leave. We need to have uh, child care here. We need to have um, like all of these different uh, sort of social initiatives, these, these, these things that make being at work in a th that makes more or less makes that company less competitive against companies who don't have that and don't have to worry about that. And they're much more it, it does the same mercenary, I guess. Yeah. They're much more masculine in the hierarchy. Right. And so when you look at like companies competing with other companies, capitalism is based on male hierarchies, essentially. You right. get a bunch of guys together and go, we're going to make a car and we're going to be better. We're Ford and we're going to be better than Chevy and Chevy's yeah. going to be better than Dodge. And we're going to, we're going to, and you're going to be the CEO and on down the line. And we're going to have people who are really competing with other people because if we don't then you know we don't drive society we don't have we don't have you know bigger and better things well when women come into that situation that's already been sort of pre-established for them they don't run that company in the same way that 
that say the guys who are, you know, Henry Ford or whoever else is putting those companies together to begin with. And so they sort of when when women come into male space, they take over that male space and they turn it into a female space because they want it to be more comfortable. And they don't understand that the competitiveness and the prosperity that that company has generated, the, the most vital element of that was the fact that there was some competition that was going on there. And that competition is really a male hierarchy, dominance hierarchy yep. put into a business sense. Well, and, and, and from a, a governmental perspective or a political perspective, I mean, what you're saying is that women tend to have more of a collectivist mindset and men have mm -hmm. more of a capitalist mindset. Mm -hmm. And collectivism isn't a total disaster until some tyrant starts running it. Mm -hmm. and there's always some elite class and then there's everybody else, right? Well, I mean, uh, that's just, uh, just you know, ask Joseph I, Stalin, right? You know? Well, I know I've, I've had this discussion with Robert Kiyosaki, who's very passionate about this. By the way. Oh, I know he is. <laughs> He's yeah. got the capitalist his, his manifesto great, out right way, now. Yeah. And so we've, we've had this, we've had this discussion before, but I always approach things from sort of like intersexual dynamics. So I'm, I'm hitting it from that angle whenever I have a conversation with him. But when we're talking about like Marx, he's, oh, he loves to talk about Marxism and communism yep. and everything else. And, and I'm like, you know, the, the, the problem with, with that, even just having that discussion is because is that it's a failed meme. First of all, yep. it's a failed idea. It's a failed concept. Let's just say, because when we look at Marxism, when you look at socialism and when you look at like communism, whatever, it's based on this understanding of what we think human nature ought to be. Right. And not what it it's is. simply, it's simply, and, and in the, we're in the, we're in the 21 years into yeah. 21 and a half years into yeah. the 21st century. We have the data, we have the statistics, we have the numbers that show that we're not blank slates. You know, we're not, um, it's not about social constructionism. It's not, a human nature is not what Karl Marx thought it was way back in the mid 1800s. And so it's failed. It's, it, we've already seen that it's failed because men and women are different. That's another thing. And we don't we don't take into account sort of this evolutionary, biological, um, psychological differences and natures of human beings. We know we're not blank slate equals. We know we're not egalitarianism doesn't work. We know that socialism and communitarianism uh, ultimately gets co-opted or ultimately, like you were saying before, when you have this sort of idealized socialism or communism or whatever, when you, when that's already pre-established, it's ripe for somebody to step in and go, well, this is great, man. It's already done for me. I can just come in here and be the tyrant, <laughs> right. you know, because you're what you're looking at is you're looking at the conflicts. And here's the red pill take on this. You're looking at the conflicts between how women organize society, how women spend money, how women allocate funds, how, how women redistribute resources versus mm -hmm. how men do it. And so when we look at like communist and socialism and, and communitarianism and how that how society is organized sort of in this female feminine way versus how men hierarchically in a dominance hierarchy organize society, we can say, well, you know, women are kinder and gentler and whatever. Yeah, but they're less competitive as well. They end up becoming very stagnant, very androgynous, very, uh, very staid, you know, a after a while. And the problem is, is though that particular way of organizing society does isn't isn't diverse enough or isn't creative enough or innovative enough to deal with challenges that might actually, you know, threaten that way of life. Right. So when, when we look at it from those perspectives, it's very like, and it, this is from Rolo Tomasi, the guy who's supposed to be a pickup artist, right? right. <laughs> this is from the guy who's, who's like teaching you game and everything else, but you have to understand the fundamental nature of men and women and the differences and then extrapolate that into, you know, your personal life, into like, what's your particular value as a man? What's your, how do men organize society? How do women organize society? What's the nature of men? What's the nature of women? And how can we go forward and create something better yeah. based on empirical evidence now that everybody right. on Google can find? And this is, this is this whole argument of this, that everybody's born and they're a tabula rasa, right? A blank slate. Nonsense. That, that is utterly disproven. It, is just so false and no matter how good your pr campaign is no matter how much media you buy and how much the corporate media promotes this idea it's simply not true you're not going to change nature mm -hmm. uh, okay i mean nature maybe it evolves but it's extremely slow at that okay so I, i've always know. said that it's better to work within the framework right, right. it's better yeah. to excel within the frame don't wish it were easier wish you were better 
Right. Like don't stop trying to change the human machine and work within that framework right. because exactly. you'll have a better society. You'll have better relationships. You'll have better, you know, complementarianism, let's just say between men and women. If you accept the nature of women and you accept the nature of men, I've always said, and, and it's people, weird that we don't, why, why is it Rolo that we don't want to celebrate these differences? We want to ignore them and act like they don't exist, which is mm-hmm. in many ways, very disrespectful to people, I, you know, like, why can't people be the the way they want to be, which kind of the left would argue, that's what everybody is entitled to, but not when it's nature, right? Yeah. You know, then it's our, wrong. our nature is to uh, exploit and take advantage of those differences when it suits us. And right. I, this is both men and women, by the way, I'm not, sure. I'm not picking yeah. on any one particular gender in this, in this sense, anyways. Um, the theme of my work for really the past, um, I don't know, probably about the last six or seven years has been calling out um, the difference, the differences between us clinging to 20th century emotionalism and beliefs and, and just really, really wanting these things to be true. But we're faced with uh, a society and uh, access to information where you know a schmuck like me can go on Google and cite sources all day long and I can connect dots and people simply don't have counter arguments for the empirical data. So what I'm seeing is I'm looking at a, a conflict of emotional investments and emotionalism versus empiricism that is inarguable. It's right there in front. Like, what do you have to say about these, these particular things? So, that, so, let, that's let, not let, just an intersexual dynamics thing. That's also like beliefs and pol- politics and religion yeah, and yeah. you name it. Okay, so we talked about that sort of broad societal thing, but let's bring it down a little bit to the more personal level if we can. What is it that at various life stages, each side of that, the the gender spectrum, right? What do they want from each other? Like what is a woman looking for, you know, at different stages of life? Tell us about that. I mean, I know the answer because I've, I've read your oh, books. You've read, so you've read the second book. <laughs> yeah. But what, you know, just explain that to the audience, if you would. And mm-hmm. then I want to go to the calculators that we talked okay. about. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And I want to share the screen. How valuable are you, Jason? I think people get a kick out of this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so let's, uh, so first and foremost, I what you're referring to is my second book, which is Preventive Medicine, which I honestly think is the sleeper hit of all five of the books. But um, that's just me personally. Uh, when I wrote that book, uh, I, first of all, when I wrote the first book, uh, I thought that was going to be the only book I'd ever write, right? Or just, I just, I, I wanted to write the book that I wanted to read. And that's exactly what I did. Mm-hmm. And then I had other people saying, Rolo, this is some brown, groundbreaking stuff. Uh, I I feel like I've always known this, but I haven't been able to articulate it. And I wish I would have known this before I got married, before I moved to a different, or before I, I changed my major and moved to a different uh, town so that I could go to college and facilitate my relationship. Mm-hmm. I wish I would have known this before I had kids. I wish I would have known this before X, Y, and Z, right? Yep. And so that's why I wrote Preventive Medicine, which is based on a timeline. And it's a general, in, a, in the most broadest general sense, okay? I'm very much generalizing in that book. But uh, it's what men can expect from women, at least in Western, actually even more than Western societies, uh, at different phases of women's maturity. So I start the book, I start the timeline anyway. And the women are saying, about. well, we mature so much faster than men. And, and you're, and you're they right do. about that. I and think they that's do. true. Yeah. They do, actually. But they mature up to a point. They, they, they mature fast and, and hot and then stop, right? Whereas for okay. men, it tends to be a more slow burn and more like build your your equity as a guy over the course of time. It takes longer for a man to oh, mature nice. into the things that make him uh, like at peak attractiveness. Mm-hmm. And so that's what I put into the timeline is I started at 15 years old and people criticize me for that. But that the reason I did that is because I have high school guys asking me about these very complex questions. Okay. So I started from 15 all the way up to about 50 or 55, I think is what the, the, the cutoff point is. So like say between the ages of 18 and 28, that's what I call women's party phase. Uh, women, <laughs> since then people have, uh, I've heard, had women call it the hoe phase, right? They go and they want to sow their wife. They're basically following a male sort of, uh, 
uh, sow your yeah. wild oats yeah. kind of, uh, you know, template there. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and they, I think on some level of consciousness, women realize that that 10 year span in their life is where they're going to be at their top of the top of their game, or they'll be able to maximize their, their peak agency years, because that's when men find women, the most attractive is between 18 and 28. And it usually tops out at about 23, 24 years old. Mm-hmm. So I, I peg women's um, sexual market value peak right around 23. For men, I peg it at about 36 because it takes longer for men to mature into the things that women find the most attractive and need the most. So it's not just about like how hot the guy is or how, uh, you know, arousing the guy. I, I make a separation, by the way, between arousal and attraction. So if you ask a woman, what are you attracted to in a guy? She's right. going to tell you, oh, he's got to love puppy dogs. And he's got to love his mom and he's got to have a good job and he's got to be funny and he's got to be intelligent. And he's got to be educated and he's got to, you know, you know, love Disneyland as much as I do. There's, those are the attractive long-term things. But if you ask a woman, what, what, what make, what gets you hot about a guy? That's the arousal side of things. So it's like, you know, a V tape or six pack abs. He's got to be six feet tall. He's got to have a, a chiseled jawline and he's to look like a stereotypical, you know, Chippendales dancer. That's the difference between those two. So I always have to make that distinction because people will say, well, what's attractive? Well, that's much different than what makes you arousing. Right. So when I'm talking about those things for women, men and women have different criteria for what makes them maximally sort of like appealing as a partner or as just a sex, you know, uh, a short-term sexual partner versus a long-term, you know, relationship partner. Um, but for men, it takes much longer to mature into what makes him maximally attractive. So if he's got money, muscles, and game, it takes him a lot longer to get that than it does for women to simply get, she's gotta be hot and she's gotta be available. That Those are the two criteria that men have uh, at, you know, f- and then anything else after that is sort of gravy beyond, beyond you know, getting your foot in the door with being attractive uh, and, you know, being hot and being available. For men, like I said before, you gotta be a much more complete package and it takes longer for men to mature into that. So the timeline follows women from like say 18 all, or 15 all the way to 50. And at various stages along the way, women Women have different criteria or they have the same criteria, but they reprioritize it differently. Mm -hmm. So a woman between 18 and 28, she might just be looking for the hot guy in the foam cannon party at spring break in Cancun. And that's what she's really looking for is that fun, uh, exciting, sexual guy who's going to really rock her world. Whereas when she gets to be about 29 to 31 years old, that's the what I call the epiphany phase. Mm-hmm. And that's when women say, I'm done with my journey of self-discovery and I got to get right with God and I've got to do things the right way. And I, you know, I need to find a guy. Where, where's the nice guys, Rolo? Where are the good guys? Where are the high value guys now? And well, they're well, hitting you you guess, know, 31 guess, years guess old what? and those guys aren't as you, forthcoming anymore. You, no, no. But there, here's the reality. You ignored all of those guys the last 10 years. Yes, you were, you were mean to them. You were rude to them and they disappeared. You know, that that's what happened, you know? Yeah. Well, there, there's, there's this hope. It's what the, it's, it's what I've called the, the betas in waiting syndrome. They're hoping right. that there'll be some guy. And, and by the way, this, I'm not just kind of pulling this out of my ass. This is yeah. like, you can go and read exactly this in um, Sheryl Sandberg's lean in her mm-hmm. advice to women is exactly what I just said. It's that's amazing. Date the, Coming date from the fun Sandberg. guys, date the bad boys, date the hot guys, date the commitment phobic guy, date the, those guys during during your 20s and then when you get to be right. yeah when you get Why to be do women 29 like jerks? every guy says yeah, that date, date the jerks you know date the bad boys yeah. until you get to be 29 30 31 years old and then start looking for a guy who wants to be an equal partner in a relationship and and he wants to do things around the house and he's really supportive of you and and um, don't worry there'll be plenty of those guys when when the time comes and if you go and you look at statistics, statistically speaking, when, when men and women in Western societies have been getting married later and later and later in life, and lo and behold, the average age of first marriage is exactly where I peg the epiphany phase. Men get married right around 29 or 30. Women are getting married about 28, 29 years old, at least in the United States right now. Mm-hmm. And they don't, women are having fewer and fewer children. And they're having them later in life. So they're having them like in their early 30s right now, which totally coincides with Sheryl Sandbergian hypergamy. You know, that's it's, it locks in perfectly with that. And so when people throw rocks at me, I go, don't throw rocks at me, throw rocks at Sheryl Sandberg. Cause that's and, where I'm getting this from. And, and, and guess what, you know, Facebook and Google and all these big tech companies, reinforce it. They'll freeze your eggs because they want you at your desk. 
and mm -hmm. your cubicle working for them. They want you to put off childbirth. In fact, they would rather you not have kids at all. And yes. most of the time, the mm -hmm. egg freezers don't ever have kids. Okay, I'll tell you what has really reality. been frustrating for me recently is like people because I have people like throw Elon Musk's uh, tweets at me recently. And he's mm -hmm. all, he's been talking about like the declining fertility rates and yeah. how he's an exception to the rule because he's got like multiple he's wives and multiple kids, kids yeah. and everything yeah. else. And I'm I'm like, I'm looking at this. I'm going, this guy is like the peak. Uh, uh, first of all, I think he's a beta male. But second of all, it's he's like the peak hypocrisy because Tesla and I don't know about SpaceX, but I do know Tesla recently made an announcement that if Roe v. Wade gets turned over to the states and there's like abortion states and there's non-abortion states, um, it's Tesla, Amazon, uh, Starbucks, uh, Goldman Sachs, by the way, too, um, and, uh, and various other companies right now are offering uh, stipends for women to cross state lines to go get an abortion in an abortion state. And come but back Rolo, that's, to... a, that's so complicated because all these companies, yeah. they're just under so much pressure to be woke. OK, you know, but it's e not Elon that, is not it's the sole not, it, thing. It's not know. just about the woke stuff. Right. Like yeah. Women are, are want to believe that, but it's yeah. in those companies economic best interest to send you across the state lines to go get an abortion if you have your kid you've got to pay for maternity leave and yeah and maternity be, leave distracted you know it's you all know. about economics macroeconomics right there there's another red pill manosphereian thing that has to do with you know abort you know, crossing state lines or what you were saying before freezing your eggs right they yeah. you don't worry about it you haven't found the right guy it's yeah, okay it's focus on your career we'll freeze your eggs it's part of your benefits package yeah it's 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 all a giant conspiracy to lower the birth rate and mm -hmm. keep women in the workforce. They and you know, you know, what, Ro 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 <laughs> you know, you know, what's so interesting about this is that before the feminist movement, and I'm really talking about, you know, wave two and three, obviously, you know, the first wave was fine. That was necessary for sure. But after that, the, this constant promotion of the feminist movement, you know, the, the sort of the complaint was, well, you know, women are under men's thumb right they they you know they shouldn't be subservient to men right they they should be able to do what they want okay fine now guess what they are now slaves of corporations mm -hmm. okay that that's what's happened they're, you they're you all just slaves of corporations and mm -hmm. and these these corporations are working them to the bone they're dying of the same stress related diseases that men have historically died of mm -hmm. now women are dying of the same diseases and you know it, it's a very unhealthy thing but somehow this myth has been perpetuated it is so strong it, it's unbelievable how powerful it is that oh you're you know like they tell women they're losers if they want to be a mom right, right? I, yeah. I mean they just they like guilt trip them into oh no you've got to work you've got to be a career woman that's the empowered woman you know i think everybody should have their own choices and do what they want but when it becomes this agenda it becomes a really scary thing. It's just weird. You know, well, like, like you've probably heard this before. Um, I, I actually got into a, uh, kind of a heated discussion when I was first uh, sort of getting familiar with Robert Kiyosaki and his staff because his staff is primarily female. And yep. I, I'll, I will go so far as to say that uh, there's a, like Nicole likes me, I guess. But like there's people on the staff that really don't like what I have to say. Mm -hmm. But I think it's primarily because they don't really have any counter arguments to what I have to say. And one of those arguments was that there's no such thing as an alpha female. And they're they were really upset when I said that they're like, well, I make my own money and I got career and I got this and I got that's yeah. But what you are is you've built your you've modeled your personality on that of an alpha male. So essentially what you are is you're an alpha male with female body parts is what you've done. You've become the man that you want to marry. And that's why when women get to be 35, 36, 37 years old and they're like, where's where's my Prince Charming? Where's my guy? Where's my turnkey relationship? Where's my high value man that I that I deserve because I did everything by the book, like what you were just saying a minute ago. Right. We teach these women that that to to be more masculine, to be in the workforce, to do these things is what makes them you know be a strong, independent woman. Yeah. And if you do and if you're a mother, if you're a homemaker, if you in any way uh, depend on a man in any way, shape. Yeah. perform you're a failure yeah yeah i know 
It's, it's, it's absolutely appalling that this has happened to society. Um, mm -hmm. But but it I is what a, it is. I, I had, I had, I had women saying, well, what do I do to get a guy, Rolo? Like, help, help me. How do I get it? How do I get the, the, the high value guy? I'm 33, 36 years old. And I'm I'm telling them, I'm saying, well, the first thing you need to do is, is what we've been telling men since the 70s is you need to get in touch with your feminine side. <laughs> you need to uh, you need to be become, you know, understand your emotionality and, and understand that, you know, there's a there men and women are different. We're better together than we are apart. We're better, you know, we're innate, natural compliments no to one another. No and they're like, well, how do I do that? How do I do that? And I go, well, you've got to get in touch with your femininity. And when I say something like that to a woman who has, for the most of her life, built herself up around this sort of alpha female paradox, uh, it sounds like I'm saying, dumb yourself down. And they, they, yeah. they can't interpret it any other way. That's not what I'm saying. But to to say, well, you need to be more feminine. You need to be more uh, nurturing. You need to be more, uh, you know, sexy. I guess too. I mean, to take care of yourself physically as well. But you have to be. You have to, in some way, care about how men think about you, yeah. in an era when you've been raised since you were five years old with Disney Pixar movies to tell you that you should never, in any way, be dependent on a man or or be concerned with anyone's pleasure except for your own. So that's a really it's really tough for women who for their whole life have heard this narrative and then now they're 36 and they don't know what to do. And I'm saying, um, you know, get in touch with your feminine side. And they're like, how dare you? <laughs> yeah, I know it's, uh, it's it's just it's it's unbelievable. I don't think there is any man that I have ever met ever and talked to that says, I want to find a woman who earns a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Like I've never heard that come out of a guy's mouth. <laughs> okay, well, I mean, well, I know I've had a million discussions on this stuff. Our but, criteria for attraction and uh, and arousal don't have anything to do with fine with the to be a man is to make and earn more resources than you can expend, because yeah, yeah. that makes you more suitable to become someone who's going to reproduce, be able to take care of kids. Uh, it's what I call the three P's: uh, protection, provisioning, and parental investment. That comes from being able to earn and create excess resources. Right. At least yeah. in a long term, like what makes a man attractive? Those would definitely make men attractive yeah yeah okay so let's let's look at the calculator for a moment okay Speaking in the interest of, of time we've got to get to this so yes. what i'm going to do here and for those of you listening on audio only we'll just explain this to you so don't don't sure. worry about it i'm going to share something called the female delusion calculator okay and this is a really interesting thing now this is not a slam and there is a male delusion calculator too, or male reality calculator that we're going to get to right after this. This is actual empirical data taken mm -hmm. from the government. Okay, the government knows how old everybody in the population is. They mm -hmm. know what gender they are. Guess what? The IRS knows how much money they make. And mm -hmm. they also have massive studies on whether someone is obese or not. OK, mm -hmm. and those are some of the criteria you're going to see in here. OK, mm -hmm. and and again, yeah. this is from the U.S. Census and the NCHS. OK, mm -hmm. now this is women looking for men, but then we're going to do men or no, this is men looking for women. Then or wait, this, this is, is women, women looking, looking for men. For men. Yeah. And then we're going to go delusions. the other way. We're going to yeah. we're going to look at both calculators. And I think this will be very interesting. So here is a female who's looking for a guy and she wants a guy. Okay. So say, say she hit that mark where she's 34 years old. Is that a mm -hmm. good number to pick? Sure. Why not? Round it off. She's going to take a guy who's maybe, you know, 34 to 50. 50. Okay. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Okay, so let, me, let me explain something here really quick. That's actually a good range because yeah. statistically speaking, and you won't find this in the, this is in the GS uh, general survey studies. Women tend to be more attracted to and marry men who are anywhere between three to seven years older than they. Oh, yeah, that's obvious. We all know that. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So now what's interesting is there's a checkbox to exclude married men. <laughs> <laughs> you know, isn't that awful? Case that you're even okay with there? that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so we're going to exclude married men and assume that you're not a home wrecker and you're you're okay. going to get a single guy, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So now let's say you're white. Okay? So we're going to choose by race. There's three choices: white, black, Asian, okay, or or any color. And so we're going to say, you know, you're looking for a white guy, right? Now, okay. his height 
Minimum six feet. Should we go down a little bit? Let's just open it up. Let's go 511. Okay. Let me, let me explain. This is the fun part right here. Okay. So because the average me, man is like five nine, I think. Right? Well, if you go and if you look at the if you look at uh dating uh data on like say Tinder, Hinge, Bumble, right. women will because you, you can put in criteria in those dating apps, okay. Yep, yep. Six foot tall is usually where women put their, their, like nothing lower than six feet tall will right. be, that will be yeah. acceptable. However, uh, uh, let's, let's go with 5'11 because the average height of the American male is 5'9". Yeah. So, so, so this is a tall six guy. Six foot tall, yeah. then you're getting into very rare territory. Right. Exactly. Okay. So now should we exclude obese? Sure. Why not? Who? How, how many women do you know who really go out and seek out fat guys? Are well, there any like big, if beautiful they're obese, men or dating you know, sites? Maybe they would, <laughs> right? Okay. Yeah. So, so now income, minimum income. How much do we want this guy to earn? And you know, I'm all into inflation, right? So we talk mm -hmm. about this a lot. Mm -hmm. I don't think eighty thousand dollars a year is very much money anymore. No. Do you know what but, the average income of a single man is in the United States? No, I don't. I households it's about forty-six thousand dollars is forty-six thousand. Okay, it's couples wise, it's about fifty-six, about ten thousand dollars more per yeah. year. Okay, so we're going to put that this woman wants a guy who makes at least eighty thousand dollars a year, mm -hmm. and now we're going to click the button that says what percentage find out. of the population is this guy? Yeah. So this is a guy that's not married, white, at least five inches, 11 tall, not obese and earning over 80,000. There's only five criteria here, folks. It's not like there's a big long list. Okay. So here's the probability. And this is quite literally empirical data that says 0.95% of the population. Less than 1%. Less than 1% meet your criteria. So what should we do? Let's go back and then we'll get to the, the male reality calculator here in, in just a sec. But let's just go back and let's make this a little easier. Okay. okay. Let's say the guy only has to earn 65,000 a year. Okay. That's okay? still high for a single guy, but that's yeah. fine. Okay. Well, not yeah. if he's 34 to 50 years old. True, true. This is not but a guy yeah, in his you, 20s. you would expect him to make more money if he was in that age demographic. You're right. Yeah. I mean, 65 grand for a 35 year old guy, you better be making that much. Should be about mean, that. Yeah. 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 Okay. Economically okay. attractive. <laughs> so all we did here is lower the income by 15,000 a year. Okay. Now, how many do we get? And this is empirical data. We get 1.3% of the population. This is not, is he funny? Is he, you know, whatever else rocks your world, right? This is, I mean, this is just uh, your, and, oh, and it, it rings. Yeah, you get your five, you get, you get five cat food bags or kitty litter bags. It, it says, it says you are a cat enthusiast. <laughs> Hilarious. Okay. Okay. So, I so think Eric know, Clary had a hand in that, just saying. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know what? Let's check one more thing, Rolo. I want to do this okay. because this is how far society has fallen. Let's uncheck the exclude married. Mm -hmm. Let's say you're willing to find a married guy and ruin the marriage. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's exclude that. Okay. Which I can't believe is even a criteria they allow here, but we'll do it. Sure. Okay. So now we only have four criteria. White guy, 5'11 or more, not Eddie obese, earning at least 65,000. <laughs> it's 6.2% of the population if you'll, if you'll wreck a home. Okay, six point two percent. Still a small number. Aspiring oh, got three cat cats. Lady. You're aspiring cat lady now. <laughs> okay. You can wreck okay. a home and be an aspiring cat lady. Now, now here's, here's the real test though, because what eliminates a majority of the c candidates is the obesity. Because you have to remember that seventy five percent of the U.S. population is overweight, and for men, thirty five percent are morbidly obese. Okay, so that's what limits most of this. Let's uncheck the obesity thing, and and let's make it literally three criteria. So where where that go? Oh, we gotta go. Back. You gotta go back. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So now we're going to uncheck obese. So you can have. You want to put the married? Do you want to put the married back on? Um, yeah. Okay. So you're not going to wreck a home, but okay. he, he could be obese. Okay. So okay. let's find out how many of those there are. And only 65,000 a year, 5'11". Okay. So 2.3% of the population. Yep. Wow. With those other criteria. That is yeah. nothing. And, yep. and 
this is unbelievable right. how small let's try, the let, no, let's, try let's try one more experiment here okay, uh, go right, back go. go back real quick yeah oh okay. no, no, yeah re, yeah there you go reset so um go okay so keep everything else uh we'll go with white um and then if you go and you take take the height down to about five nine because that's right. the average height of the american male right. it's okay. five nine okay. uh put exclude uh well actually Let's leave obese in there because we got it. We're trying to broaden the like. Let's let's you know broaden. Trying the, to get the, some more selection. Let's, let's get some more depth in the field here, right? Okay, so here we go. Now, this my ideal man. This is a woman looking right. Not so your, prob your probability. Okay, here's your criteria: not married, white, at least five five feet nine inches, and earning. He could be any weight doesn't matter on weight, earning mm -hmm. at least 65,000 a year, which I hardly think anybody thinks is a ton of money. Mm -hmm. That's only 4.1% of the population yep. and 7% 7 7 of the white I population. Mm -hmm. So the delusion score is three cat litter bags, aspiring cat lady, all right? Yep. Let's do equal time. Let's look okay. at the male reality calculator. Okay. So How this far is what less? men are looking for in women. I'm glad they did this too, because there's a lot of guys who want like their virgin bride and this hot girl and everything yeah. else and what they think they Good deserve. Good luck with that. Yeah, you're mm -hmm. not going to get it. So now let's see how delusional men are. Okay. Okay. You, you got two guys talking to you here. How delusional are men? Do we <laughs> and what, want their a woman. What, what do we want in a woman, yeah. Jason? Okay. <laughs> so, so what age is she? So say this guy is in that other age group. Say that guy is like 34 to 50 that she was looking for in just a moment ago. Okay. So okay. Um, the age. Uh, same cohort? So no, 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 no. Can't be the Most same. Most guys cohort. go for younger women. Younger. That's why I was So let's say, let's say 25 to, uh, you know, childbearing kind of what's commonly considered, we'll go 25 to 35 years okay. old. Is that Sounds good? 10 All years. Right. Good. Okay. okay. Exclude married. Okay. And okay, what about, mother. and what about single moms? Okay. Single moms is what's going to throw, it's going to skew the, the, the average, but you can, if let's, let's do that. Let's do our ideal first. First here. time we'll exclude them. Okay. So no kids and not married a single woman and mm -hmm. we'll uh, do, we'll I'm good with any, but if you, wanted, if you want to, if you want to keep it white, we can do that. Yeah. Well, we were doing the other one. White yeah, white. that's fine. Now height. What do we do there? Uh, average height of women, I believe is five, four, but so I would start right around five, four. And I would go as tall as say, like he, like most women don't want a guy who is shorter than they are. Mm -hmm. So if you went to five, nine, or you went to, let's go five eleven as the max because. You, oh, wow. Like, that's tall. That's tall. Yeah. Because women yeah. want to tall. I mean, that is the number one, uh, most universal attraction cue for women no, is no, no, no. But this is guy. this is men. I know, I understand that. But yeah. what I'm saying is, like, you got to remember that if if you are under a particular, like, if you are over a particular height, you don't want a woman that's taller than you. So right. the average height of women is is probably about five four, I believe, in the United States. But uh, you, it, like the maximum, you'll notice that the maximum height is here. In the other one, it is like the minimum height for guys because women. Uh, tend to have height as one of their primary attraction cues right. in, in dating apps and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, you know what, Rolo? I think this probably should be about 5'8", five, five, eight, if you ask me. Okay. Well, yeah. let's do that because average height of a of the U.S. male is 5'9". So you don't want her any taller than the average yeah. guy, right? Okay. Right. Okay. So this is a, uh, so this is 25 to 35 years old, mm -hmm. not married, not a mom, white, five four to five nine oh wait you gotta then, do exclude obese there exclude yeah. overweight oh, or obese. okay 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 so exclude those just like before now minimum income the guy doesn't care <laughs> okay but really? he probably wants her to have a job right so she mm -hmm. you know to know she's responsible enough to have a job right so we'll make thirty thousand dollars minimum okay, click income. that little check box over there this and one? that'll be the maximum so what's oh. the maximum you want to set it at Oh, like in other you words, you want her to earn more than X. Oh, pound. good point. So maximum, let's go 60,000. Okay. So she makes 30 to 60,000 a year. Okay. All right. All right. How many women fit this description? Meet the bill. Yeah, fit the bill. You, you, you <laughs> males need to come down to reality here. Okay. And your expectations. Okay. Now, by the way, this does not say, are you attracted to her? Is she good looking? She yeah. just is a certain height, weight, you know, et cetera. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So not married no children yeah, white yeah. not overweight 1.6 
six to seven percent of the population. So one point six percent of the population matches your desired between those ages, okay. twenty five and thirty five. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Black pill doomers like the MGTOW community, the guys who are just like, you know, incels who are just like, hey, hate on life. They'll use this and go, see, there's no reason to do it. Yeah. But 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 this one, instead of aspiring cat lady, it's aspiring bachelor. <laughs> bachelors. <laughs> <laughs> Three red pills. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. So Rolo. Do you want to you want to tweak any of those? But I mean, yeah, that's yeah, that's let's do one more. Be, let's but, do one more, yeah, folks. OK, okay. Well, let's tweak it a little bit more. So what should we be tweaking? Um, Go back. Let's oh, reset. We're okay. out of it now. Here, let's go back. Okay. okay. So, what's right. the age? Let's, um, let's let's broaden the age group. Let's let's go eighteen as the youngest. Wow. Just because that's, that's, that's adulthood. Okay. Let's just okay. let's just so we got an idea between yeah. a certain age. It's not like oh, we're gonna. Age I mean, age. look. Ideally, any guy is gonna say you know under thirty if he wants to have kids would be ideal. Right. Okay. Or maybe to thirty-two. So, what should we put in here? Um, I would leave it at 35. I mean, what's okay. the, because right. at any time, well, really at any age after 30, I believe women's uh, a chance of conceiving and carrying a child to term like drops precipitously, but let's, let's uh, err on the side of being, you know, let's, yeah. let's be a little but, bit But more. what if we don't like that? And what if we think that's unfair to say that Rolo, you shouldn't say that. No, oh, well, oh, wait, oh, well, you, you know, this whole, could, this whole could the reply, is could the reply be, could the reply be <laughs> trust the science? It could be. Uh, you don't even need the science. Trust the statistics. That's all yeah. this is. It's based on research. It's ba look at it again. It's Census Bureau data. It's yeah, GSS yeah. data. It's a national nope. healthcare data. Yeah, I'm um, talking about the the science of childbearing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So right. I mean, if you go and you yeah, trust the science, anyways. But yeah. um, I mean, you can. Uh, there's lots of research about this. When, when it comes to your vaccine and global warming, you better trust the science. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Do we want to open up? the race to any any race well let's keep it the same race because that's okay. where we started okay, okay. and let's keep height. the height the same okay. yeah. and overweight you know, obese nobody yeah, wants right. a fat okay. Okay. and the income's the same okay, okay. so she's not going to make more but now all we've done is tweak the age like yeah. we, we broaden the pool a lot a lot yeah. we we open the age up there wow. we go almost three <laughs> percent it's 2.85 percent that's still nothing it's unbelievable. I love I this. Mean, Roughly 1.13 million women in the United States meet your ideal woman standards. Compared to 320 million people. That's yes. like a needle in a haystack. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Good luck. Good luck finding her. And they're all oh, on OnlyFans. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It doesn't mention she might be morally bankrupt. Yes. <laughs> you know, it doesn't yeah, mention well, a million other things. <laughs> Home records, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's unbelievable. Well, Rolo, clearly there is a problem here. Mm -hmm. what are people to do? And let's wrap up today with this and, you know, we can talk more, but uh, another, um, another day. Okay. But. So let's uh, see if what, I can, what's the prescription of optimism here. Yeah. What's yeah. the prescription? I don't deal in prescription. I deal in descriptions, but occasionally people <laughs> ask me this question, like, what do we do? Yeah. Wait for the meteor to come and crash into the earth. Um, I think that it's probably a little bit more op we can think of things a little bit more optimistically uh, when like you can you can do things to maximize your chances to actually, you know, get with th that very slim margin of women out there who are, would meet your ideal standards. The other thing is this is lower your standards. And most most people will do that. It's one thing to say this is my ideal. It's another thing to say well she'll do or he'll do yeah. and i think that for men we have uh like men have a much um as much as women would like to you know preach the opposite men have a we, we tend to be what what's known as opportunistic breeders right we we will take nobody's ugly after 2 a.m right if it's available um and she's she meets the minimum criteria most guys will hit it right for women it's different because women's mating strategy is based on quality not quantity so women especially today believe that they are entitled to the high value man or we were just you know for the female delusion calculator and nothing but the best will do and if you want to know why marriage rates are at the all-time low right now since they started recording marriage rates back in the 18 like 1848 i think um, we are now at 
persons per 1,000 in the United States that are married, which is the lowest it has ever been. Divorce rate, by the way, is also low because no one's getting married. (laughs) So, um, and all of this, if you you can trace all of this back to the sexual revolution and the uh, advent of hormonal birth control, which is unilaterally controlled um, from, you know, more or less by women. Mm -hmm. So we have to go back and look at the, all of the changes that have happened societally from a gender specific perspective from about 1965 because that's when the pill was was invented and that's when the sexual revolution happened and then the boomer generation and summer of love and you know the 70s and disco and swingers and key parties and all that good stuff um and then so now here we are sort of two generations three generations since then um we're the product of all of that so how do we like course correct well i would say the first thing we have to do is we have to be a little bit more realistic like look at stats like this and stop thinking about things in immediate terms and thinking like seeing the force for the trees it's what robert green calls um thinking uh, grand strategy versus thinking tactically and he's been on the show a few times too oh really yeah i i, I absolutely I, there's two people i would be starstruck by if i was ever on the same show with them <laughs> robert green is one and gad mm-hmm. Is another <laughs> okay. you guys, yes, mo- most definitely. But uh, I love Robert Green's take on um, and and uh, by the way, um, he's written all those books. Uh, I mean, you know, power, power and all, all of those books. Yeah. War, uh, uh, you know. what is it? Art of seduction, that kind of yeah. stuff. He's like he's really a great thinker. I think he's one of the great minds of this era. I, I, I mean, you read his stuff, and it's just a whole history lesson. It's Connects amazing. Dots. Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, in Thirty Three Strategies of War, he talks about the difference between strategic, like grand strategic mm-hmm. theory, is thinking versus like winning a battle versus winning a war. Right. So when women are looking for like the ideal guy, they'll go on fresh and fit or they'll go into the calculator and they'll type in all, this is what I want in a guy and nothing else will do. Well, the problem is, is we've told, we were just talking about this before we teach women to be the strong, independent, you know, archetype, the trope right now, and nothing else will do. So only the best will do. Well, the problem is, is that leaves women who are, you know, unmarried and increasing numbers, the fertility rate drops, marriage rate drops, forming families drops. Now, it might work great for corporate interests, like we were saying before. But the problem is, is that until women become more realistic in their attraction, because it's not in women's sort of biological evolutionary best interests to take some to take a guy who is substandard and reproduce with that guy. That's uh, in in our in, you know, their evolutionary memory. It is a death sentence to get with a guy who is substandard. They don't want to, you know, hitch their cart to a loser. And that's female mating strategy. And that's the biggest obstacle. I think if you want to course correct, you've got to get around that because you're not going to tell a woman you should take what you can get, girl. That's not going to happen. However, you do have to be realistic with women and hopefully in a certain percentage of them, this sinks in and says, you know what? I know you've been told, you've been sold this bill of goods that you can have it all and you can be an astronaut and whatever Disney and Pixar okay. told you when you were five years old. Great. However, you need to think in terms of grand strategy as opposed to thinking tactically. So you have got to like I tell my daughter the same thing. My daughter is 24 years old. I tell her the same thing. I said, look, you're you're at the top of your game right now, but you need to start thinking about the future. You need to start thinking about, do I want to be a mother? Do what what, do I I want my life to look like when I'm 34? Because the landscape in 10 years is going to completely change for me to say that I sound like this misogynist ass. For, for even, you know, judgmental for saying something like that. But men have to, especially fathers, have to risk that judgmentalism and be more judgmental. I think really by, by human, way, like everybody, society needs to be more judgmental and fearlessly, unapologetically more judgmental because you're going to have more cases like Tinder swindler, you know, women going, yeah, they right. do a whole documentary on something like that on, on Netflix, which could have been avoided had a father a brother uh, a strong conventionally masculine man come in and say no you're not doing that if Mm -hmm. you can do that on a societal level where you say look here's the facts here's the reality the guy you want to get with is represents less than one percent of the population so if you're going to think in terms of grand strategy you better take that into account before you start like planning out the rest of your life yeah rollo by the way i i want people to have some context about you and know you have been married for quite a long time. You have a daughter who years I, in I July. Is, is is 21. You have a 21 year old daughter, right? Uh, she's 24. Um, 24. I've been married for, well, in July, I'll be married 26 years. 
Okay, so you've been married 26 years, you got a 24 year old daughter. So it's interesting, you know, that you're out there talking about this stuff, right? And, uh, you know, because you definitely you live in a home, well, or at least lived if your daughter's she's probably out of the nest now. But oh, yeah. Um, yeah, nowadays, you never know, they stay for a long time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, she, uh, she just finished her postgraduate at UNLV. So she's got a master's degree right now, too. She's done very well for herself. She's a, a pageant is, girl. She's a very she's she's done everything by the book, you know, she's, okay. she's very she's she's Rolla Tomasi's daughter put it that way <laughs> okay so this is a great point and before you go and you alluded to it earlier but we I have not heard the word yet today hypergamy okay so what I thought about when you told me your daughter got her that was a master's you said mm -hmm. yeah when she got her master's now tell us what hypergamy is and how women always need to marry up as an evolutionary strategy sure. right sure. so now your daughter needs to find a guy who has a phd if you're putting it right. in the uh, if, you put it in, if you put it in socioeconomic yeah. terms then yeah. yes that would be true however yes. hypergamy is a lot more than just just more than about economics so uh, yeah i get it um so what hypergamy is is and let me just uh, as briefly as i can put this uh, hypergamy is a term that was coined by a sociologist back in the 50s and i don't know that i've you know, his name escapes me right now but he was studying the caste system in india at the right. time you know like the the, the hierarchy sure. and uh he was noticing what uh that w young women of a lower caste would uh, would have a tendency to marry into want to marry into a higher socioeconomic caste so mm -hmm. which makes sense right and so he called this hypergamy this, this tendency for a woman to marry up now right. since that time we've broadened the definition of hypergamy to include what we call out i'm going to be the say it politely the alpha seed and the beta need side of it so there's the hypergamy is really the dualistic nature of women's mating strategy they're looking for the best guy who's the best specimen who is the uh, hot guy in the foam cannon part he's he's hot she's he's represents good genetics she really wants to have a good sexual experience with him he's short-term sexual but he's somebody that she wants to breed with because he look he's like i said six foot tall he's got v taper he's got chiseled jawline very you know conventionally masculine and then there's the beta buck side which you know for again for lack of lack of a better term he's the guy who's a good dad it's like cads versus dads and the dad side is the three p's as i mentioned before which is provisioning protection and parental investment rarely do those two those two ideal qualities meet in the same guy at the same time mm -hmm. and so rare is that we just looked at this on the calculator so rare is that that women don't even look for that guy at particular times in their lives mm -hmm. so a girl who is between 18 and 28 she's not really thinking about the long term as i said grand strategy she's only thinking about the here and the now because everybody's throwing everything at her because it's an attractive young woman in that age demographic right there she's the world is her oyster until she gets 29 30 31 years old which is average age of first marriage she's checking out of the sexual marketplace and she's now no longer the, the criteria she'd love to get up with a hot guy don't get me wrong but she, the criteria have the priorities of that criteria have changed now he's got to have a good job now he's got to have some sort of future now he's got to have some sort of like he's got to have a master's degree right he's got to be educated and so now you're 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 stacking the priorities in different in in a different order now they're still important maybe looks is now two on the list or three on the list but he's got to love his mom and he's got to want kids and he's got to have a good job and he's got to be a good bet for the future that's going to be different than when she's like say 18 and she's just like let's go it's spring break let's go right, right? right. um so that's the that's essentially what hypergamy is however the other part of this is that women when they are instead of tending to marry up they're tending to look up in this hierarchy of guys who are hotter than the last guy or are better candidates so when we talk about an alpha male or a, a high value guy um in, on the 10 scale say a woman is like a six on a 10 scale she believes that she needs to get with a guy who is at least a six and if he's a six she's looking for a seven she would much rather get with a guy who's an eight nine or a ten of course if that's if she could do that but women are always looking up the sexual market value scale for men because they have what's known as an attraction floor they can't get with a guy who is beneath them they like I, I i pointed out this way is a woman cannot look up to a man who is her equal she has to look up to a guy who is above her at least whether that's socioeconomically that's status wise that's looks wise that's look at all those criteria he's got to be better than she is if she's a six 
he's got to be a seven. And women who are a six believe that they should get with a nine because all their girlfriends on Instagram are getting with guys who are, you know, they're living their best life all the time. And they look like they're living on vacation all the time now. The fake life. Yeah, exactly. So, so you've got women who are looking up that scale and then you get to what's known as the 80, 20 rule, which is 100% of women want to get with the top 20% of guys mm -hmm. and the 80% of guys who are deemed as quote unquote unattractive. They don't even figure they don't even fact they're invisible. They don't even factor into that. And even the guys who are the 20% are guys they might do. And then of that 20%, four and a half percent of those guys end up being the guys who are attractive and hot enough for women to actually want to initiate something with them to begin with, like whether that's on Hinge or Bumble or Tinder or whatever else it is. So you can see hypergamy played out in the dating market statistically, research-wise. You can see how women, like with their, with their preferences and what they're looking for when we're gathering data from like Match.com or Tinder or Hinge or Bumble, hell, even Pornhub. If you go and you grab those, those statistics and look at what their, the mating habits of like say western nations are are you can see hypergamy played out and proven statistically and empirically now for men men do not have an attraction floor as i said before they tend to be you know scattershot with our mating strategy it's unlimited access to unlimited sexuality and what i mean by that if you if you don't believe me all you got to do is ask <laughs> let me ask you this i'll ask you this question why is it that porn is free 4k streaming and ubiquitous right now Right. Because it because it satisfies unlimited access to yeah. unlimited sexuality, at least vicariously, anyway. And, 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 and novelty. There's a not, yeah, exactly. Well, that's that unlimited novelty. access yeah. to unlimited sexuality. Yeah. And so men don't have that attraction for. So a guy who is a, a six would very much like to get with a seven, eight, or a nine, or whatever, if he could, but no one's ugly after 2 a.m., right? So a, a five or a four might do in a pinch. You might be, be slump busting, but there's no attraction floor for men. Whereas for women, from a biological evolutionary perspective, um, yeah. they're looking for at their like hypergamy never seeks its own level. It's always at its level or it's above. Or, or above and it's yeah. like, eh, get, you know, there's there's a lot of wiggle room for men because it's like I want to get I want to have that sexual experience because men are opportunistic breeders. So that's in a nutshell, that's kind of like hypergamy versus like men's mating strategy versus women's mating. And, strategy. and, and you, you know, it's, it's sort of obvious, right? I mean, women are the choosers and that's why so, there's so much written about it and your work and all of the others in, in your field, because women make the choice. They mm -hmm. pick, they, the women are the evolutionary choosers. Men it's perform, women men. decide. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. What's that? What's that? Saying? Men perform, women select, women yeah, decide. Right. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting about it too is women just kind of have to show up, but a man has to earn it. He has to do something with his life. He has to make an actual effort. Now, men granted, must become, you know, men must yeah. become and women just are. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's really quite interesting when you uh, think about these dynamics more deeply like that. But it makes sense from a from a, just a biological standpoint. I mean, women have very few eggs, so they have to protect mm -hmm. the choice of them. There's a timeline with pregnancy. Obviously, men can just go out and keep you know uh, keep spreading their seed, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's why the dynamic is so different. It's just so vastly different, and that's why hypergamy has to exist because women have a scarce resource. Yep. And we're in a society that tells us we're all the same. Yeah, <laughs> what a myth. <laughs> yes. yep. Yeah, it's a total myth. Rolo, give out your website. Tell people sure. where they can find sure. it. You can find me at therationalmail.com. That is my blog. Um, you can also find me. I do a live stream at the very least once a week on YouTube. It is The Rational Mail. I'm usually on 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, I have five books in the uh, Rational Mail series, which are all available on Amazon. Just type in uh, the Rational Mail and you'll find all five of them. The most recent one is the Player's Handbook, where I get into sort of the nuts and bolts of like social dynamics. And and I, it's not a how-to book. It's a why, why it works book. Yeah. I also do Ro uh, Rule Zero, which is our panel show, which is on Saturdays at 1130 a.m. Eastern. Yeah. And we sort of pass that around. I, and I want to share with people how big a deal Rolo is. I mean, his original book, I'm looking at it on Amazon now, The Rational Mail, has 5,800 reviews, mm -hmm. okay? 
I mean, how many books do you see with almost 6,000 reviews? His audio of that book, or a different book, has 1,500 reviews. I mean, these are five-star reviews. The volume three in the series on audio has 1,326 reviews. I mean, how many books have you sold, Rolo? I mean, you're an amazing well, um, successful author. That's kind author. of difficult to say, because I, yeah. um, I, it sort of depends on the book itself. Um, yeah. The, uh, the uh, original book is in the millions right now. But wow. the um, the other books, it just kind of depends on the book. Like like book two is actually very very popular, but and book five, I also did a book on religion as well. My I should I guess I should tell you about the series. The um, sure. the second one is preventive medicine. As I was saying before, it's based on a timeline and what men can expect from women at various phases of maturity. Uh, then there was positive masculinity, which is book three. Um, I wrote that because I had so many guys asking me like, oh, when should I give my sons your book? <laughs> mm -hmm. And I'm like, don't <laughs> you raise your kids. Right. You know, if you go and set an example, but they wanted a book on red pill parenting. And so I gave it to them and, and I talked about social issues. P positive masculinity is really more about social issues and then um, and then raising kids. And then uh, then I did religion, which was a three year project um, mm -hmm. that I, I put more time time and energy into that uh, book because I, I I did intersexual dynamics in perspective of belief religion it's not bashing religion and it's not it's not if you're an atheist don't think that it's going to reinforce your your take and if you're a religious person don't think it's going to reinforce your take everything I do is always objective I tr do my best I have what what Gad Saad says I have a an obligation to objective truth and that's what I try to, to present in all my books and then of course the fifth one is the player's handbook which is like why social dynamics work and like how you like people always want to say what's the best book on game rollo i'm like i don't know i guess i better write it so that's that's really okay. what i did that which one. By, by the way let, let's just talk about that for a moment mm. so the left and the feminist crowd has been quick to bash this idea of you know men studying this stuff is mm -hmm. oh it's evil these guys are you know trash and certainly there's no question there's a lot of trashy guys out there you know mm -hmm. learning these things right but how many women in in the tens of millions, if not a couple billion, have had over and over again the experience of, you know, they they know this guy, they like this guy, they so wish he would make a move. Mm -hmm. Like they're just waiting for this guy to make a move. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he doesn't have the confidence, he doesn't know what to say, he doesn't think he's he funny, whatever the, it is. Or he right? just he's oblivious. Yeah, yeah. Or, he, or he's just oblivious. Mm -hmm. And they want him to mm -hmm. strike up a conversation, mm -hmm. to get the thing started. I mean, mm -hmm. how many women have spent hours getting ready to go out at night, right? Mm -hmm. Or to go to some social event, and it's like no guys approach them. Mm -hmm. And they're just yeah. devastated, yeah. right? You know, and, and this is why this is good for women, okay? Mm -hmm. This is women need men bettering themselves in mm -hmm. all ways and mm -hmm. one of those ways is social skills mm -hmm. so Absolutely. you know what do you say to that because you've heard well, all the criticism they, i so I, I just to let you know a couple other statistics here i've been doing this for 20 years i started uh i started my illustrious when, when your daughter book. was four yeah. Exactly. Yeah. In 2002, um, I started uh, working on, well, I was working. I started um, in, involving myself in the seduction communities of the time and the forums and everything. Now, I was married back then, so I was not going out there and being anybody's wingman or anything. You, but you I was were six years married. Position. Yeah. I was in a unique, unique position because I worked in casino marketing. So I was doing promotions. I was always out in the clubs. Mm -hmm. After that, I, well, right around that time, about 2004, Four, I got into working in the wine and spirits industry. And so I was doing mm -hmm. promotions for that. So I'm always out in the field. I'm always, I'm kind of like, you know, like Diane Fossey or Jane Goodall, you know, I'm like watching <laughs> humans, you know, what are they, what's the, what's the male going to do with the female now? You know, like that. So I'm taking mental notes and then I'd, what I would do is I would bring it back to those forums and we would have discussions about that, which came, became the blog posts, which became chapters in my book and which led up to me doing what I've been doing for 20 years now. And you are correct because over the course of that 20 years, I've seen guys go from hitting on women in the clubs and running game on them in the clubs and in whatever fashion that they're doing it to the point where, uh, you know, you got eHarmony and Match.com and Plenty of Fish and people wanted that buffer. They didn't want to you know, really risk rejection, but they were at least on 
like match.com, they were writing, you know, bios and profiles about them. Here's what I'm looking for in a woman. Here's look, you know, for a man. And now we've evolved from that, those profiles to, to Tinder, where all we're doing is hmm, swipe left, swipe right. Oh, he's, he looks hot. He looks cool enough to hang out with. It's and the so number shallow. one dating yeah. apps are really, you know, Tinder, Hinge, Bumble. And really the number one dating app in the, you know, the world is Instagram. Because if you meet a woman at the club, what's the first thing they do? Follow me on Instagram. They don't mm -hmm. care about phone numbers anymore. Right. Follow me on Instagram. Let me see if you're cool enough for me to hang out with right. you. And then, then we'll go from, are you, do you have a blue check mark? Are you verified? Right. Yeah, on right. these? That's just, that's a status symbol. And so we do things like the, the nature of human beings, when it comes to like wanting to get with another person, like, you know, heterosexually speaking, wanting to get to with that other person, the, the desire and the mechanics and the evolution and the, the human machine doesn't change, but the context in which we meet each other definitely changes. And you're exactly right. Most women, their number one complaint is guys don't approach. I go to all this trouble and I, I'm, I'm in the clubs and they're the, there's very few guys there in the first place. And the few guys that are there have the, have the, the sack to come up to me and, and ask me out on a date. And they would say that, you know, the number one thing they want is it would be so refreshing for a guy to actually do an approach. Now, the problem is, is most guys are scared shitless to do that yeah. because they're afraid of a sexual assault, you know, or sexual harassment. They're afraid, they're afraid that they're going to blow it. They're afraid of rejection really more or less, but, but also there's an additive to that now, which is uh, me too. And, and they don't want to, yeah. you know, only, only hot guys are allowed to approach guys. Average guys are not allowed to approach because right. if they do, then it's a hate crime, right? Then it's yeah. like misogyny. Then it's, and so they, they simply say, screw it. I know that, I that's what's interesting. You know, like I, I always kind of have this funny idea in my head. I mean, Harvey Weinstein, for example, mm -hmm. he's gross, right? I, I mean, I hope, you know, I think he has gotten what's coming to him. and objectively. But, but yeah, <laughs> but I always wonder, what if Harvey Weinstein looked like Brad Pitt? What if he was an attractive guy? Like, would that have star. ever happened, right? Mm -hmm. You know, would anybody have ever said, oh, you know, he did all these bad things? What if he was attractive, right? Mm -hmm. Isn't that discrimination Absolutely. against ugly guys, right? Yes. Like Harvey Weinstein, and, right? You know, it's, you, it's just sort of interesting. It's, like when you think of it empirically like that and you take the emotion mm -hmm. out of it, you know, that's just the way it is. Yeah. You know, it's it's very unfair. Well, right? Women, here's what's happened. You know, remember we were just talking a little while about like, what, what do societies look like when women organize societies? What does it look like when women control the purse strings or the economics of that society? The other thing you need to ask is what do, what does the sexual marketplace look like when it, when women are the ones who are deciding what is correct and what is not correct? Right. And so in an era where like, you've, you've probably heard women say this before, I don't need a man yeah. You know, a woman needs a man like a fish needs a bicycle. Oh, right? yeah, I don't Gloria need Steinem. a man, yeah. but I want a man. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They right. don't need the guy. I mean, they perceptually anyways, they are, they're the strong independent woman who can provide for their own long-term security. They don't need the beta bucks provider, protector, and parental invested guy because they can go have babies themselves by freezing their eggs or whatever. You know, women can electively have or not have kids these days. So what man do they want? They want the guy who looks like Brad Pitt. They want the guy who's the alpha C. They want the guy who's going to rock their world. That's what they're looking for. You want to know what you just asked me a minute ago, like, how do we go forward? How do we change it? Well, you've got to make women aware of that. And you've got to, in some way, find a, a way to say, look, you've been deciding who gets to even come up to you and ask you out on a date right now, because if they don't meet your particular criteria, they go to jail. They're criminals yeah. for actually making that approach unless they're hot. And if they're hot, then it's then like you were saying before, Harvey Weinstein, if he looked like Brad Pitt or Chris Hemsworth or something like that, we would be having a much different conversation. When that happened, when the, the Harvey Weinstein thing would happen, I had this conversation with Rich Cooper. I said, why is it that a guy like Gene Simmons from Kiss is, doesn't have like me too charges just up and down, up and right. down the block because he's a rock star yeah. because he's Gene freaking Simmons. Yeah. That's why, he's but he's not, not good looking. <laughs> yeah. And Gene Simmons is not a good looking dude. Right. Yeah. But he's, you know, look, he's, you know, arguably he's been with a lot of women and you could make the same case for a lot of other guys who are good looking and are conventionally alpha that aren't getting me too. But the guys who look like creeps, those are the guys who are the first ones to go down. Yeah, right. I know that's that's really if you think about that just objectively and empirically, that is so unfair.
It, it, it just is, but yeah, it, well, it is what it is. It deserves got nothing to do with it, Jason. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. That's for sure. Well, Rollo, hey, thanks for joining us today. Really interesting and very long conversation. <laughs> yeah, pick and pull what you want, man. Turn it into three different shows. That's good for me. All right. And, you know, the books are in all the usual places. Of course, the reviews are incredible. And oh, I, I should also add the, um, the Audible books. We just passed 200,000 units for our, the Audible books. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I always say on my show, compared to what? Folks, this is in an era where if you sell, there are so many books in the world nowadays. If you sell over, get this, you ready? 5,000 books. That is considered a really good success. I mean, if you're an author and you, you want to write a great American novel or a nonfiction book or whatever, and you sell 5,000, you are a rock star. And Rolo has sold millions of books. So check out his stuff. It's really enlightening. It really is. The Rational Mail on Amazon. All right. Rolo, thanks for joining us. You got it. Anytime, Jason. 